we go. All right, so the cardiovascular quiz is going to be all by its lonesome. Because it, did you print it out? Mm -hmm. It's a big one, yes? yes. Okay, so um, we'll do that all by itself. Is that okay? Don't hate. That's right. Okay. Um, really, what it comes down to is uh, people either um, like the cardiovascular system or they um, dislike it. There's n not too much in between. Here we go. I hope you love it. Ready? All right, watch. The functions of the cardiovascular system are right here. It's recorded. I'm not going to read them. Say yeah. Okay, real quick, what's the goal of the body? That's right. So write this down, never forget it. The goal of the cardiovascular system is to uh, to maintain blood flow. Now that you're going to be trained in some anatomy and physiology, you're going to have to start learning medical terms. So anytime you see flow of any kind, it's always Q. So if you see Q, on a medical sheet, it's referring to some type of flow. In this case, we're talking about blood flow. All right? So a couple of things here. Number one, and we'll get into more detail. Number one, um, the average blood flow for an average size adult, the cardiovascular system pumps about... 5,000 cc's of blood each minute. Now, if big people, Shaquille O'Neal, he's probably pumping eight or nine liters a minute. Little people like, I don't know, mini me, right? They're maybe pumping two and a half, three liters. But the average is about 5,000 cc's per minute or five liters per minute. And when I say that you the goal of the cardiovascular system is to maintain blood flow. Let me, let me clarify that, right? When I say maintain blood flow, that means that, bless you, whatever the body is demanding in terms of blood flow, right? Anything that, whatever the body is demanding in terms of blood flow, the cardiovascular system has to produce. True or false? When you exercise, you have to pump more blood. That's true. So if your cardiovascular system, your body's demanding 10 liters of blood flow per minute, and you can't, your cardiovascular system can't maintain it, you pass out. Say yes. Okay, all right, you know this, I'm going to go through this lickety split, say yeah. yeah, okay, hang on, what are the two types of vessels you got in your body, what? You got arteries and you got veins, right? In the strictest of definitions, arteries take blood away from the heart. 
So if a vessel carries blood away from the heart, it's an artery. And then veins, they take blood to the heart. What are arteries and veins mostly made out of? Come on, cut it out. What are arteries and veins mostly made out of? That should be a question, huh? Muscle. And what are the two things that muscle can do? There you go. You better write this down, right? And the most important element in muscular contraction is calcium. And watch it. Watch it. And I told you this before, and now I'm going to tell you it again because now we're going to apply it. The heart and blood vessels, arteries and veins, they rely on calcium from the blood to contract. And again, the only way that you can get calcium from the blood into the heart cell or to an artery and a vein is through a specific calcium ion channel. Say yeah. That's very good. All right, here we go. What's wrong? No. What's wrong? No. Just, just. Hmm? Just. Okay, here we go. The cardiovascular system is divided into two parts. Part one, systemic circulation. Part two, pulmonary circulation. In this case, what I'm going to talk about, when I talk about the differences and similarities between arteries and veins, I'm going to talk to you about the systemic circulation or the arteries and veins that supply the, uh, supply the cells of the body. All right? So if you look at arteries and in the systemic circulation, you need to get this. Arteries in the systemic circulation carry oxygenated blood, blood that is high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide. They have thick muscular walls. And the reason they got thick muscular walls is because they are under pressure. So systemic arteries are referred to as the resistance vessels. Got me? Thick muscular wall, under pressure, and I'm just going to go over this real quick. Artery B, because the diameter is bigger, has lower resistance to arterial blood flow meaning blood travels through a bigger artery easier. And where does arterial blood always go? Don't even answer it. I'll just tell you. It goes the path of least resistance. Tell me you got that. So arteries that have a larger diameter, more arterial blood flow will go through them because there's less resistance to blood flow. Say yes. yes. That's very good. Okay. Now, 
as arteries move away from the heart, we know this. You learn this in general. Hang on. As arteries move away from the heart, they get smaller, right? So the pressure in the arterial system as you get farther and farther away from the heart goes down. So the amount of muscle in systemic arteries as you get farther and farther away from the heart, oh, this stopped working. Hang on. Did you guys bring your book? Did you? Do you want to read it in the book for a while? Oh yeah. Tell me. Uh, hang on. Let's see if this works. If this doesn't work, then what I'll do is you can work together in groups and you can try to answer the questions yourselves. How does that sound? Okay. I think that's good. What do you think? You want to try it? You, can, you don't have to come to class. You guys keep forgetting. You know, I don't take attendance. You don't have to come. Do you understand? You don't. Don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. Let's see if this works. If it doesn't, then that's what we'll do. All right? If it don't work. Yes. Don't worry. I'm the teacher. I got degrees. You got to get used to that flipped classroom, too. Ready? Ready? Here we go. Okay? I just told you that as arteries move farther and farther away from the heart, the diameter gets progressively smaller. And what happens to the pressure? Don't even answer that. I'll just tell you. The pressure begins to drop. So the pressure is the greatest in the large arteries of the systemic circulation. And when you get down to the level of the capillary, we learned about this, never forget it, that the Pressure in the capillary is about 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury. Okay? All right, so watch. And we learned through two curved lines and a circle, right, that you have the arterial end of the capillary, then you have the venous end of the capillary. Oxygen goes into the cell, sits at the end of the electron transport chain. CO2 goes from the cell into the blood, and arterial blood becomes venous blood. Now, let's talk about systemic veins. Here we go. Systemic veins, no pressure. Right? Thin muscular walls. This is all reviewed from general. Everyone knows this. Thin muscular wall. And they take venous blood back to the heart. Right? And by definition, we know that venous blood is low in oxygen and high in carbon dioxide. We talked about this, right? So no pressure in the veins, systemic veins. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about these, all right?
keep. So there's no pressure in systemic veins. Systemic veins have one-way valves that only open up towards the heart. Okay. And, whoops. Don't write largest arteries. I'm sorry. That's my mistake. You're going to have to, you have to erase that. I'm going to erase that. I'm going to rewrite it. The largest veins of the body, largest veins of the body are deep inside muscle. All right. So let's look. Yeah, I'm going to go to the blackboard page. And I'm going to click on your class. Then I'm going to course documents. I want to keep you informed of everything that I'm doing. find it I'll find it okay here we go boy I hope this thing works your heart is a pump it's a muscular organ about the size of your fist we'll let him talk slightly left of center in your chest your heart is divided into the right and left side the division protects oxygen rich blood from mixing with oxygen poor blood Together, your heart and blood vessels comprise your cardiovascular system, which circulates blood and oxygen around your body. In fact, your heart pumps about five quarts of blood every minute, and it beats about 100,000 times in one day. That's about 35 million times in a year. Oxygen-poor blood, blue blood, returns to the heart after circulating through your body. The right side of the heart, composed of the right atrium and ventricle, collects and pumps the blood to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. The lungs refresh the blood with a new supply of oxygen, making it turn red. Oxygen-rich blood, red blood, then enters the left side of the heart, composed of the left atrium and ventricle, and is pumped through the aorta to the body to supply tissues with oxygen. Four valves within your heart keep your blood moving the right way. The tricuspid, mitral, pulmonary, and aortic valves work like gates on a fence. They open only one way and only when pushed on. Each valve opens and closes once per heartbeat, or about once every second. Okay. A beating heart contract. Did you catch that? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's the circulation of blood through the heart gonna have to know that you got me all right let's see this one of the things that I want to explain to you is this the video didn't explain a good job oh wait hang on Okay, let me get this set up. Okay. So, we know that, hang on, you have um, the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. And we know that the, the right side of the heart, the right heart, um, pumps blood 
that is high in carbon dioxide and low in oxygen. Right? And it pumps that blood to the lungs. And we learned when we learned about the equation that all that venous blood gets pumped into the blood vessels of the lungs and it gets smaller until it terminates at the level of the alveoli and the pulmonary capillary. And that's where gas exchange occurs. And then all that newly oxygenated blood comes back to the left side. And the left side of the heart then pumps that newly oxygenated blood down to the cells of the body. All right? Now, a couple of things, very, very important. The right and left side of the heart pump exactly the same amount of blood. If they don't, then you have a condition called congestive heart failure. So you, you don't want that. You should write that down. Okay? So watch. Where did the right side of the heart get its blood from? It got it from all the veins of the body. And when that venous blood comes into the right side of the heart, it gets pumped to the lungs. And then all that newly oxygenated blood comes back to the left side. So in reality, the amount of blood pumped by the left side of the heart is equal to the amount of blood pumped by the right, because the right and left side of the heart pump the same amount of blood. Now, you can extrapolate that. And you can say, watch, if the right side of the heart pumps, the amount of blood that it pumps is determined by the amount of venous blood that's returned to it. And because the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart pump the same amount of blood, what you can extrapolate from that is that the amount of blood pumped by the left side is ultimately determined by venous return of blood to the right heart. Now, again, this is pretty high level thinking. So <clears throat> what I'm what I'm telling you is that Whoops, hang on a second. What I'm telling you is that what ultimately determines the amount of blood that's pumped by the left heart, meaning the oxygenated blood pumped by the left heart, is ultimately determined by the amount of venous blood that's returned to the right side. So anything, I would write this down. I'm going to put a star next to it because I think it's important. As a matter of fact, I'm going to color in the star because I think it's very important. Right? So I made the star. Anything that decreases... Venous return of blood to the right heart. Hang on. Anything that decreases venous return of blood to the right heart. Okay, now this is important. Whoops, hang on. 
that will decrease oxygenated blood, O2 rich blood pumped to cells of the body. Okay. Now, where do you store a lot of extra venous blood? In your legs, right? Is there any pressure in your legs? No. In the veins? No. So by gravity during the day, you're upright. Can everyone see this Diet Mountain Dew at the bottom of the bottle? Yeah. So by gravity, it's going to pull all that venous blood down into the legs. You got me? So when somebody's bleeding blood, what you do is you lay them down and you lift their legs up. And by gravity, all that venous blood is going to come back to the right side of the heart. And when more venous blood comes back to the right side because you lifted their legs up, more blood will get pumped to the lungs, and that means more oxygenated blood will come back to the left side. That's why in a hospital, they have a bed where you can push the button and the feet go up when the blood pressure drops. That's why they do that. Did you think that was interesting? A little bit. Okay. All right. That's why people pass out when they stand. Right? I'll explain that more in a minute. Okay. So, one of the ways that venous blood, right? Now, this is important. Venous blood gets back to the heart is, remember, there's no pressure in the veins, right? Where are the largest veins of the body? Don't even answer that. I'll answer it. They're deep inside your leg muscles. So when you get up and you walk, you actually squish the veins and that forces open the one-way valves and that's how you get venous blood back to your heart. Now, the heart happens to be in your chest and you learned in chemistry there was a law called Boyle's Law. So watch. When you breathe in you actually contract your diaphragm and the diaphragm flattens out like this. So that squishes on the abdominal vena cava and when you increase the volume of your lungs that decreases the pressure in the thoracic cavity and pressure always goes from high to low. So walking, contracting skeletal muscle, that gets venous blood back to the heart and Breathing, the actual act of breathing, gets venous blood back to the heart. That's called the thoracic pump. So two ways that venous blood gets back to your heart are through contraction of skeletal muscles. Whoop, I spelled contraction wrong. Contraction of skeletal muscle. And um, the one-way valves and number two is the thoracic pump that's why when people are about to pass out they'll start breathing kind of weird they'll kind of breathe like <laughs> you, did you ever see that did you ever see anybody pass out no okay but they do. So that's how blood gets back to your heart. Now, there's terms that you need to know. So anatomical terms that you need to know. Number one is preload. Preload 
is a term to describe Venus return to the heart to, well, be specific. It, it's really the right heart, right? So when you hear terms like preload, you're thinking of Venus return to the right side of the heart. And anything that affects Venus return to the right side of the heart is going to affect preload. So that's a term. Hmm. Now, watch. Preload, right? Preload, Venus return to the heart. That's, again, going to determine how much blood is pumped by the right heart. And remember that the right and left side of the heart pump the same amount of blood. So the amount of blood pumped by the right heart is going to be equal to the amount of blood pumped by the left. So this is important. Anything that affects preload or venous return to the heart is going to affect the amount of oxygenated blood sent to the body. Do, do you follow that? So how do you affect preload, right? So what can affect that? Well, w one of the things that you're going to have to learn about is body position. We talked about that, right? So does anybody work in a nursing home here? Okay, that's nice. Well, I used to work in a hospital, and when people had congestive heart failure and they had a hard time breathing, we'd immediately sit them up. Do you know why you do that? Do you? Well, maybe you'll learn that when you get into clinical. <laughs> There's a hope. Okay, the other thing that affects preload or venous return to the heart, this is number two, would be blood volume. Now, one of the things, and I'm just talking here right now, I'm not explaining congestive heart failure. I'm just talking right now. Okay? So don't include this in your answer when you talk about congestive heart failure. I'm just trying to kind of give you a lead into it. Okay? Watch. Hang on. Okay. Now look. One of the things that can happen in congestive heart failure is you can get congestive heart failure if you have a heart attack, okay? So part of the heart muscle here is dead. I've labeled that in black to uh, indicate necrotic or dead. So that's dead heart muscle. Are, are you following that? So if part of your heart doesn't work as good as it did before, it's dead, so it doesn't work at all, is the left side of the heart, or the left ventricle, is it going to contract as good as it did before? No. So if you add more blood back to the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart works just fine. So it's going to pump all that blood to the lungs. But if the left side of the heart isn't working so good, do you want the left side of the heart to work harder? No. So if you add more blood back to it, you're going to make it work harder. And it will cause that heart to fail. It won't be able to pump all that blood out 
Do you follow that? So this is very important. And the, these are some of the things that nursing students, they just don't get, but that's okay. So when the left side of the heart begins to fail, where did the left side of the heart get its blood from? Don't even answer, I'll just tell you. It got it from the lungs. So when the left side of the heart begins to fail, that blood begins to back up into the lungs. And they get a condition called pulmonary edema. Did you ever hear of pulmonary edema? That's a sign of heart failure. If you work in a nursing home or even a hospital, when people are about to die, their heart begins to fail really bad. And fluid starts backing up into their lungs and actually pushes into their larger airways and they get the death rattle. Have you ever heard that? That's the death rattle. Then that means they're about to die. That's why it's called the death rattle. Okay. Did you follow that so far? Okay. That's really good. Now, watch. There's different sides to the heart. There's a right side and a left side. I just illustrated to you what happens when your left side of your heart fails. It backs up into the lungs. When the right side of the heart fails, where did the right side of the heart get its blood from? Don't even answer. I'll tell you. It got it from the body. So that blood will begin to back up into the body. And watch, must put the cap on the Diet Mountain Dew. Don't want to spill it. Because most people are upright during the day. All that venous blood settles in their legs and it pushes that fluid into the interstitial space of their legs and they get swolded legs. That's why a person with congestive heart failure has swollen legs. What did you think? Okay. All right. That's very good. All right. Now, watch. This is very important right here. The next thing I'm going to tell you is very important. I'm going to write B-I. Very important. As we know, the right and left side pump the same amount of blood. Isn't that correct? Yep, I'll just tell you. So, but they do so under different pressures. I would write this down. The right side of the heart develops a systolic and diastolic pressure of 25 over 15. The left side of the heart develops a systolic and diastolic pressure of 120 over 80. Now, if you don't know what systolic and diastolic blood pressure mean, you better learn that. You got me? So what I'm trying to tell you is even though the right and left side pump the same amount of blood, the left side has to work about five times harder. And the reason it has to work five times harder is it has to send oxygenated blood to all the cells of the body. Where the right side of the heart, even though it's pumping the same amount of blood, only has to pump that venous blood to the lungs. Now, it's like anything else. If you 
are always running your car at a really high rate of speed, right? It's working harder. That car will break down, right? Because you're making it work harder. So when people talk about having heart attacks or having problems on their heart, it's almost invariably the left side of the heart. So when someone has a heart attack, you're almost always talking about the left side. And more specifically, you're talking about the left ventricle because the ventricles are the primary pumps. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Now, there is a concept that you guys have to know, and it's called mean arterial blood pressure. Mean arterial blood pressure is a measurement that is used in, whoops, in ERs and ICUs to determine levels um, if an individual is in shock, okay? Let me define shock for you. Shock is the inability of the cardiovascular system to maintain maintain blood flow Q to the brain and vital organs. That's that's the definition, that's the textbook definition of shock. So if somebody is in an accident, like a car accident, and they're sitting on the side of the curb and they're like bleeding and they're, oh boy, it's terrible. They're not in shock. They could be going into shock. They could be shock E but they're not in the textbook definition of shock because watch in the textbook definition of shock it's the inability to maintain blood flow to the brain and if blood flow to the brain is interrupted only momentarily they will lose consciousness so that's the textbook definition of shock yeah Okay, this is how you calculate mean arterial pressure. And I'm going to tell you this, that in an average adult, mean arterial pressure must be greater than or equal to 60 millimeters of mercury. If they're not, they're in shock. And they cannot... They don't have the ability to maintain blood flow to their brain and vital organs. And how you calculate it is this. It is two times the diastolic blood pressure. And we'll put parentheses around that so you do that first. Plus your systolic blood pressure divided by three. Now, the reason it's two times your diastolic divided by three is because two thirds of the time, the heart is in diastole, meaning it's relaxing, not contracting. Did you follow that? Okay, so here, hang on. Let me give you a blood pressure and then using our formula, determine if the person is in shock, okay? A person has a blood pressure of 80 
over 30. Go ahead and do the math and see if that person is in shock. I'll do it along with you and then we can check our answers. Yes. Wait, I didn't do it yet. Okay, I got an answer of 46.6666666 millimeters of mercury. Is that what you guys got? Okay, and 46 is less than 60 in any language. So therefore, this person meets the textbook definition of a mean arterial pressure of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, so they will be in shock. Okay, now in clinical you're going to learn about the different types of shock. I'm going to just state them for you. If you work in a hospital environment, you probably heard these terms. Number one, cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic, let's break that word apart. Cardi meaning heart, genic originating in the heart. That essentially means that the heart muscle fails as a pump. So like a big heart attack could cause cardiogenic shock. Okay. Number two, you have anaphylactic. Wait, do I, I, I know how to do it. Anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock is a total body allergic reaction. Okay. And that results in um, uh, bad stuff. Okay, so that that's number two. Number three is neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock is the result of uh, essentially deactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system fails. Now, that's different between spinal shock. Spinal shock, I don't know if, do you know what spinal shock is? That's okay. Number four, I'm on four, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. This is um, hypo volemic shock all right and this um, has a couple of subcategories one is hemorrhagic shock meaning you just bleed out right but hypovolemic shock can come in many flavors which you will learn about later so those are the four types of shock. Um, just so you learn some terms, learn some terms, right? Um, neurogenic and anaphylactic. These are referred to as distrib Butive shocks, meaning 
what happens is all of the arteries throughout your body dilate. That's a distributive shock. Now, if you recall, we learned about the byproducts of metabolism, right? I'm going to tell you them. My missing heat. Oh, and hypoxia. Okay. These are massive arterial vasodilators. Dilators, right? Now, in this class, hopefully you learn about one thing that causes all of your arteries to constrict, right? And that is the sympathetic nervous system and epinephrine. Now, if you recall, I just explained to you that an anaphylactic shock, it's a distributive shock that causes all of your arteries throughout your body to dilate. And in this class, we learned, hopefully, that we know one of the things that causes arteries to constrict, and that's epinephrine. That's why people who are allergic to bees and peanuts and stuff, they carry a epinephrine pen. Okay. That's very good. Okay. So that's mean arterial blood pressure. Okay, all right, that's a question on the cardiovascular quiz. Did I answer that? Okay, all right. Now I'm going to answer, I answered preload, correct? Now I'm going to um, address afterload, and I'm going to address it in conjunction with Ohm's flow law, because that's how it should be done. Okay. All right. All right, let me just get out of this for a second here. Okay. Um. Okay, um, in the interest of just um, getting through this, um, this is, I'll just tell you, the, the left side of the heart, specifically the left ventricle, pump, pumps oxygenated blood to the body, and it pumps it through systemic arteries and systemic arteries are made of muscle and they can do two things they can contract and relax right mm -hmm. so ohm's flow law is described as q which is blood flow and Q is actually determined by your systolic blood pressure. And your systolic blood pressure is the force of contraction of the left ventricle. LV stands for left ventricle. You may want to write that in parentheses left ventricle. So that's the force of contraction. And it's also determined by the resistance 
to arterial blood flow. All right. Now, you can relate these two to determine blood flow. And how they're related is that Q is determined by your systolic blood pressure divided by your resistance to arterial blood flow. Now, again, um, here's a little uh, fraction. So I'm going to take my time with this. Okay. So let's go through this. And I'm going to, um, this is very important, very important. All right. We learned that Q in an average adult is about five liters of blood per minute. So each minute, the left ventricle pumps out five liters of blood. And we can relate this to the fact that five liters of blood is determined by your systolic blood pressure. And a normal systolic blood pressure is about 120 millimeters of mercury, right? It's measured in millimeters of mercury. Okay. Divided by the, whoops, the resistance... to arterial blood flow, all right? Now, and this is very important, what determines the resistance to blood flow is almost exclusively, it is exclusively in this class, it is determined by the diameter of arteries. Okay. Now watch. Watch. This is very important. When the arterial diameter is larger, right? And we'll talk about situations that can do that. So this is true. This this hole is bigger than that hole. That's going to have decreased resistance. to arterial blood flow. Okay? If the hole gets smaller, the, the hole in the artery that the arterial blood is flowing through gets smaller, right? The resistance to arterial blood flow increases. Okay, now, again, some terms you should become familiar with. If the arterial diameter was large and then it got smaller, that's called vasoconstriction. All right, if the artery was diameter was small, and then something caused it to get larger, that's called vaso, vasodilation. So how blood pressure and blood flow are ultimately determined by the cardiovascular system is by controlling the diameter of arteries. And that's what physicians use in many respects to control blood pressure. They control the diameter of systemic arteries. Yes? Okay, so let's look at this now. Let's apply this.
and we'll we'll start using some numbers again units here don't really matter right so if you're pumping five liters of blood per minute and that's determined by your systolic blood pressure and your systolic blood pressure normal systolic blood pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury and that's divided by the resistance to arterial blood flow so what I'm telling you is that the resistance to arterial blood flow is 24 right so 24 into 120 is 5 so I'm kinda making this up I'm not kinda I am making it up right what I'm telling you is that the average diameter of the arteries throughout your body to pump 5 liters of blood per minute I'm telling you the average diameter throughout your body is this big. Are you following that a little bit? All right. Now, watch. Again, what's the goal of the cardiovascular system? To maintain blood flow. So let's say, for example, and this can happen. That it can happen. It does happen. That... 90% of all people with high blood pressure, it is idiopathic. Idio, idi, idiot. They don't know. Pathic is they don't know why this person has high blood pressure. Right? So it doesn't matter why. It just has to be treated. So what can happen to individuals naturally over the course of time is that arteries over the course of many decades, the arterial diameter will progressively get smaller. They don't know why. Idiopathic. So now this requires some critical thinking. What's the goal of the cardiovascular system? I'll just tell you, to pump five liters of blood, maintain blood flow. Now watch, if the arterial diameter gets smaller, what has to happen to the resistance to arterial blood flow? Does it get higher or lower? It gets higher. So I'm going to double it for ease of mathematics. So now the resistance to blood flow went up because the arterial diameter got smaller. So in order to maintain 5 liters per minute, what has to happen to systolic blood pressure? It has to go up. So it now goes up to 240 millimeters of mercury. So now this person has high blood pressure. They're hypertensive. Now, we learned on quiz number one that the most important element in muscular contraction is calcium. And I explained to you, and I will never forget it, that the arteries and the heart rely on calcium from the blood to contract. So here, I'm going to label it for you is a calcium ion channel. So in this picture, calcium would be found here in the blood, right? So that's floating in the blood. Now watch. If calcium from the blood goes through a specific calcium ion channel and gets into that smooth muscular wall of the artery, the artery will contract and the arterial diameter will get smaller. 
So what will happen to resistance to blood flow? It will go up, and to maintain blood flow, systolic blood pressure will go up. So doctors will give you a medicine that prevents calcium from going into a ion channel and causing the artery to contract. Instead, by blocking it, the artery will dilate. And if the artery dilates, what happens to resistance to blood flow? It goes down. So what happens to systolic blood pressure? It goes down too. So one of the medicines that physicians use to control hypertension are called calcium channel blockers. And they, um, uh, what did they end in? Oh, they end in um, Zem. Have, have you heard ever a Cardizem? Diltiazem? Have you heard of those? Those are calcium channel blockers. Do you ever think that if you graduate, you will give a calcium channel blocker? Yes. Well, I do too. That's a coincidence. <laughs> so that's how that works. Did you understand that? Yes. That's very good. So one of the biggest ways that physicians control blood pressure is by controlling the diameter of arteries, how they do it. Did you follow that? Okay. All right. Now, Okay, so um, I'll do this and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you a break, okay. I'm going to answer a question on how arterial blood knows where it's supposed to go, okay. Then I'm going to explain to you why you have to turn people every two hours. Then I'm going to explain to you why they tell you when you turn somebody over that was laying on their back on their side that you gem gently rub the reddened area. Do you know why you do that? No. Because that's what they told you to do in CNA <laughs> school. <laughs> That's what they tell you. So we're, 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 this class isn't about learning anything. Well, this class is about just doing what you're supposed to do. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Can't see, move. You don't want to see? Don't move. <laughs> Ready? My hand is alive. Got me? So I'm going to cut off blood flow to it. Do you follow this? So when you lay somebody on their fatty acid, you're cutting off arterial blood flow. Do you follow that? So. You're laying there compressing the arteries that's 
apply skin to the crack of their butt, their heels, the back of their head. Do you follow? Mm -hmm. Right? Is my hand still alive? Yes, look. <laughs> Are you following? So, is it producing carbon dioxide, heat, ADP, hydrogen ions? Is it? No. Yes, it's still alive. Is it lacking oxygen? Yes. Yes. And all of those byproducts of metabolism are what? Building up. And they're building up, but what do they do to the arteries that supply my hand? Dilated. They dilate it. So when you turn the person over and you relieve the pressure, the area becomes red. And what? What? The longer it stays red, the longer it lacks blood flow. Dana, what does heat do to arteries? Dilate. That's why when you roll them over, they tell you to gently rub the skin because the friction of your hand produces heat and causes the arteries to dilate. Okay. <sighs> Go on break. No, I didn't. No, that was started. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Don't so, mind me. Is there anything else I can do? Continue. Continue teaching us. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Ready? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question now. Okay. Have you ever cut yourself? Dana, I'll ask you. Have you cut yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all I really wanted to know. But Dana cut herself. <laughs> Good job, Dana. Okay. When blood leaks out of your vascular system and it falls on the ground, what, what does it do? Well, no, what does the blood do? It coagulates, right? Do you know why? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Ready? Blood, it, once it falls on the ground, is it moving anymore? Oh, no. no. So you should write this down. Did you write that down? How many people wrote that down? That's good. Okay. Let, let's go back. Where, where do you store a lot of extra venous blood? In your leg. <coughs> you got me? All right. Is there any pressure in the veins? No. So when you have abdominal surgery... This is a scar. Abdominal surgery is painful. This is how people breathe when they have abdominal surgery. Go. Because it hurts to take a big deep breath because that stretches out that incision. Ouch. 
So when people have surgery, do they want to get up and move around? Is there any pressure in the veins? Venous blood gets back to your heart by moving. That's why when people come out of surgery and they've had abdominal surgery, they're given an anticoagulant. And they're given that because they know they're going to be reluctant to get up and move around. And what does venous blood do that doesn't move? Clots. Hang on. Wait, maybe I got this. Yup. Have you ever seen these? Yes. Those are called sequential decompression devices. They will inflate and deflate to mimic you walking. That's why when people come out of surgery, they got them on their legs because they know they're not going to want to get up and move around. See ya. Yeah. So, okay, if you get this right, if you get this right, this is going to be a big one. If you get this right, uh, let's see, what, what do you want? You want extra credit. Okay. How much? That's it? Okay, yeah, you're right. <laughs> How much do you want? Okay, good. For 50 extra credit points. Okay? All right. True or false? And you have, I'm going to time you. <laughs> you have from the time that I asked the question, you will have five seconds. And your first response is your final response. Are you ready? And that's anybody, right? That's anybody. Okay. Ready? Here's the question. A clot in a vein of a leg can, will cause a stroke. Okay. You were so close. If you would have said false, you would have been right. But you said true. And you don't get 50 points. I knew I was, you could have would have said 100 and I would have gone with it. Really? Yeah, because I knew you weren't going to get that right. Okay, here we go. The education of Gateway Technical College students will have to continue. I don't know why this drives me insane, but it drives me insane. Okay, watch, watch. Who's watching? Everybody. Okay. Where do all the veins of the body dump their venous blood? Let's say you get a clot. Oh, yes, son of a... Let's say you get a clot right here. 
in a vein. Mm -hmm. If that clot dislodges, what happens to the diameter of the veins as they get closer to the heart? They get... So will this clot block any of the veins as it moves back to the right side of the heart? Mm -hmm. Right atrium, right ventricle. What happens to the size of the pulmonary vessels as you get deeper <coughs> into the lungs? So a clot in a vein of your leg will not cause a stroke. It causes a pulmonary embolus. Mm. Tell me you found that. Mm -hmm. The only thing that can cause a stroke in terms of an embolus is a clot in the arterial system. <coughs> Say yes. That's a leg. It's a hand that looks like a foot. That's an artery. Our systemic arteries under pressure. Yes. When you feel your pulse, you're feeling the left ventricle contracting and relaxing. That little pulse that you feel is the left ventricle contracting and increasing the pressure in the arterial system. That's how you know how many times your left ventricle contracts by feeling your pulse. Are you with me? Yes. So what kind of blood is carried through arteries? Oxygenated blood. Write this down. Do large arteries of the body, are they on the surface of your body? Did you ever itch your femoral artery? No. <laughs> That's because it's deep inside the body to protect it. And the large arteries are deep inside the body so the blood that they carry is warmer ain't that right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure is. and it's highly oxygenated so it's red and it's warm Dane ain't that right see and there are occasions where arteries will come to the surface. Your carotid artery, radial artery, axillary artery, say yeah, yes. brachial artery. Uh, that's where you take blood pressure. Your dorsalis pedis? Say yes. yes. So if somebody got a clot in an artery, what their foot gonna look like? It gonna be what? Cold and blue. It gonna be cold, blue, 
pale and because the nerves need oxygenated blood they're gonna start to get pain and then numbness and tingling and then they will lose all sensation that's why watch probably in this class don't blame you you fall asleep on your arm you cut off the arterial blood flow because your gourd weighs a lot and when you wake up that arm is dead right because you cut off the arterial blood flow to it feels cold tangly are you following this so if somebody has an arterial clot in their leg, that extremity is going to be cold, pale, blue. Will there be a pedal pulse on the top of their foot? No. Say yes. You're following this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now look. Uh oh just erase that artery uh -oh. now you got a clot in a vein of that leg will warm red arterial blood still get there will it still get there sure so what will the foot look like? It will be warm, red. But will venous blood be able to return and move away from that? No. So watch it. That's why I made you learn those pressures. What's going to happen to capillary fluid pressure if venous blood can't get back? Arterial blood is going to continue to come down, but venous blood can't get back to heart. So what's going to happen to capillary fluid pressure? It's going to go up. It's going to force fluid out of the capillary into the interstitial space. And that foot's going to get what? Swolded. That's how you differentiate an arterial thrombus from a venous thrombus. Do you follow that? Can I tell you something? I explained that beautifully. Yeah. So at the end of class, I'm going to give myself a high five. And they will ask you these questions when you get into class. Am I right, Dana? They'll say, differentiate between a patient with an arterial thrombus and a venous thrombus. And most of you, by that time, will be in horticulture. <laughs> Which is a daisy. Did I tell you I ran into a student? Can I tell you this? I'm going to tell you anyways. Ran into a student uh, just down there. She's a good student, right? And uh, she ran into some problems in clinical. She was trying to work full-time and go to school full-time and then had a baby. <laughs> so she goes, Tim, uh, I didn't realize until I was like halfway through the semester that there's no way I could do that. No way. So she ended up failing, and now she's retaking the classes. But she goes, Tim, I had to quit my job. So I say it unto you. What? You can't go full time then. Well, right. those, those are your options. You try that, it will end poorly for you. But it doesn't matter. Do you know why? I got mine. Can I get away? And all I'm trying to do is help you. I know. If you can't figure that one out, I'm not going to work that hard for you. No way. 
At the end of classes, I'm exhausted. I ain't gonna be exhausted today. I got stuff to do at home. I got a life, Rachel. <laughs> How many people got that? Yep, yep. That's right. So if you've got a clot in an artery and you don't remove that clot, that limb or whatever will die. Tell me you got that. With a DVT, venous blood can move around it. There are anastomosis to veins. So venous blood can move around it, just not as well. So that's why that pressure builds up. Say, yeah. Okay. That's very good. Did I answer that question? Yeah. I killed that. Okay. All right. I'm going to finish after load. Okay. I explained to you preload. Yes. I'm now going to explain to you after load. I'm writing after load. And now below it, I'm going to define it. It's determined by the resistance to arterial blood flow. What determines resistance to arterial blood flow primarily? The diameter of arteries. So when arterial diameter is large, resistance to blood flow is low and preload is low. When arterial diameter is small, resistance to blood flow is high so pre uh, afterload is high. Did I say preload? Yeah. I'm sorry. Resistance to blood flow is low when the diameter is larger, so afterload is lower. And if the arteries are smaller, resistance to blood flow is higher, so afterload is higher. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to explain to you how cardiac muscle contracts, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an overview of the different components of muscle contraction, okay? And then I'm going to explain to you how a muscle actually contracts. Are you following that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is now where we talked about making ATP. You're now going to learn where we actually use ATP. I mean, we've talked about ATP until we're ATP in the face. <laughs> See, like blue in the face. <laughs> okay. Wait, I got to do this first. Maybe, maybe you guys already know this, so. All right. Again, um, what's the most important element in muscular contraction? And the heart and arteries rely on calcium from the blood to contract. You got me? Okay. So embedded in cardiac muscle cell membranes and the membranes that make up the smooth muscle of the arteries and veins, you have embedded them those protein ion channels called calcium channels. So yeah. And I'm going to simplify this for you. Um, later in the semester when we talk about the nervous system and skeletal muscle contraction, I'll get a little more detailed. But right now I just want you to understand, and I'll tell you what I'm expecting. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we don't know this yet, but we will learn this. 
the heart is unique in that it can generate and sustain its own electrical activity, right? What that means is, is that if somebody has a cervical spine injury where they have a spinal cord that's damaged, can they move any of their skeletal muscles below the side of the injury? No. But does their heart still beat? Mm -hmm. That's because there are specialized cells inside the heart that generate and sustain its own electrical activity. That's the electrical conduction system of the heart. All right? That's what makes possible heart transplants, right? If the heart required nerve impulses from the brain to contract, then you would have to transplant the person's brain and spinal cord along with the heart, right? But because the heart's able to generate its own electrical activity, you can transplant an individual's heart. That's very important that you understand that. How, how many people are with me? Okay, so this is what I want you to understand. In muscle, there are two major contractile proteins. Do you know what they are? What are they? They're called actin and myosin. Are you following this? Now, myosin has hanging off of it these things that look like green hearts. Okay? These guys are called, that's a bad color. These are called the myosin heads. And the myosin looks like herds, myosin heads. And sitting on that myosin head, very important, is a molecule of ATP. Each myosin head has a molecule of ATP that sits on it. Are you with me, guys? Yes. Okay. This is the most critical piece ever. In a heart that's not damaged and at rest, you got me? You have actin molecule and you have a myosin molecule. Do you understand that? Now watch. In a resting heart, the actin and myosin molecules are lined up like this. Watch. You have the actin molecule and the myosin molecule. You're following me. The only place that they can make connections, the myosin heads can connect to the actin molecule, is where they overlap. So right in this area here. Are you with me? But in the heart, if you stretch the heart by adding more blood back to it, you stretch the actin and myosin filaments, and the actin and myosin line up better. So the number of connections between actin and myosin now is greater so the force of contraction of the heart is greater. That's called Starling's Law of the Heart. Watch it. In a resting normal heart, if you add more blood back to that heart, you will stretch the walls of the heart. And when you stretch the walls of the heart, you line up the actin and myosin better. So the force of contraction, how hard that heart contracts, increases. Say yes. Yes. That's beautiful. Okay. Watch it.
What sits on the myosin head? What determines, I'm going to write this out, what determines FOC, force of contraction of the heart, is the number of connections between actin and myosin. Who, who's following that? That's good. Okay, let's look at the actin molecule. Are you ready? The actin molecule here appears to be a pearl necklace. You got me? And this little licorice whip is a protein rope called tropomyosin. Are you with me? Now watch. In a non-contracting muscle, the tropomyosin covers the binding sites on actin for myosin. If tropomyosin covers those little yellow spots there, the myosin head cannot connect to the actin molecule. What determines how hard the heart muscle contracts? The number of connections between actin and myosin. If tropomyosin is covering those little yellow sites on actin, can myosin bind to the actin molecule? So that muscle is relaxed. Say yes. Okay. Now watch. Attached to the trop tropomyosin molecule is the troponin complex. What you need to know is you have troponin I, troponin T, and troponin me. There's an I and a me in Timmy and no you. It's troponin C. Are you with me? Okay. All you need to know is in the troponin complex is troponin C. Now I'm going to spitball here and hope for a break. Calcium, when it enters the actin and myosin filaments, it has to bind to one of the three troponin proteins. What troponin protein do you think it binds to? That's very good. So when calcium binds to troponin C, it causes the tropomyosin molecule to twist out of the way. And when the tropomyosin molecule twists out of the way, this little myosin head will bind to actin. Tell me you're following this. Mm -hmm. What sits on the myosin head? And when the myosin head binds to the actin molecule, that molecule of ATP sitting on that myosin head gets broken off to ADP plus energy. And that energy 
is used to swing that myosin head that's now connected to the actin molecule and it will pull the actin molecule along with it. Say so, yeah. And when you're pulling actin, Dana, you're contracting. Like when this camper's a rockin', don't come a knockin'. Did you ever see that on a camper? Like back in the 70s and 80s? You know what I'm talking about? Jana, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, see, those are the days. <laughs> rockin' campers. Here we go. Ready? Now I'm going to show you an emanation. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, this is how you're going to start. This is how you're going to start. Write this down. Calcium from the blood enters the contractile elements through calcium ion channels. Who's following me so far? Calcium will flood into the actin and myosin filaments. Watch it. Watch. Calcium's flooding. Look, the little red balls. In this video, the myosin appears to be blue chicken wings. <laughs> and the actin appears to be partially chewed beer nuts. <laughs> Who's following so far? Watch. Calcium from the blood is going to flood into the actin and myosin filaments. Calcium will bind to troponin C. Who's following? When calcium binds to troponin C, it's going to cause the tropomyosin molecule that's covering the binding sites on actin tropomyosin is going to twist out of the way and reveal those binding sites for the myosin head on the actin molecule here we go see it twisting out of the way whoops went too far when tropomyosin twists out of the way, the myosin head has a natural attraction for that actin molecule. So the blue chicken leg hooks up with the partially chewed beer nut. Ready? Tell me you got that. What sits on the myosin head? And, oh, you son of a... Ready? Okay, here we go. So the myosin head's now bound to the actin molecule. What sits on the myosin head? ATP. And when the myosin head binds to the actin, it's going to cause the third phosphate on ATP to be broken off. That's going to swivel the myosin head that's now bound to the actin molecule, and it's going to pull that actin molecule along with it. Tell me you got that. Yes or no? Mm -hmm. What determines how hard the heart muscle contracts is the number of connections between actin and myosin. Who's following this?
So when a normal resting heart, when the heart's contracting, the only place that the connections between actin and myosin can be made is where the two overlap. Do you follow that? Mm -hmm. So at rest, your heart shouldn't be contracting and pounding out of your chest because it doesn't have to generate a lot of pressure. Do you follow? Say yes. Yes. But if you add more blood back to the heart, it will stretch the walls of the heart and the actin and myosin line up better. So now when the heart does contract, what happens to the number of connections between actin and myosin? Increases. And therefore the force of contraction of the heart goes up. Yes. For real? Mm -hmm. Hold on. I'm going to get this. Don't worry about it. If somebody is bleeding their own blood, I'm going to walk you through this. What's going to happen to your blood volume? If your blood volume decreases, that's going to cause a decrease in venous return. Are you with me? Yes. If less venous blood is coming back to the right side of the heart, that will cause a decrease stretch of the right heart. So if the heart is not stretched as much, so normally it was like this, you got me? Then you started bleeding your own blood, and now it's like this. The alignment is even less. So what's going to happen to the force of contraction of the right side of the heart? It's going to decrease. Who's with me? So that will drop the force of contraction, and that will lead to two things. That will lead to a drop in systolic blood pressure, and it will also lead to a drop in the amount of blood pumped per beat of the heart. Yes? We learned that the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart pump exactly the same amount of blood. Where did the left side of the heart get its blood to pump? Where did the left side, where's the left side of the heart going to get that blood? It's going to get it from the right side. Where did the right side get it from? The veins of the body. Well, I'll just tell you. And venous return of blood to the heart, the right side, it's called preload. So anything that reduces preload is going to reduce the stretch of the heart. So now you have less blood on the left side. There will be less stretch of the left side. Therefore, the force of contraction on the left side will be lower. The amount of blood ejected with each beat will be lower. And the pressure with which that blood is ejected will be lower. Tell me you got that. 
And if you can't maintain blood flow to your brain, you are in what? Shock. Say yeah. That's why watch. When people bleed in their own blood, they stop the bleeding. <laughs> they put pressure on it. Oh, hey, stop it. And then they lift their legs up because there's no pressure in the veins. And where do you store a lot of extra venous blood? Okay, we did good today. All right, just so you know, uh, Thursday will be quiz number two. If you want to take a multiple choice, and for people who aren't prepared, I prefer that you take the multiple choice, just so you know, that'll make my life easier. And remember, it's all about me. Say ya. Okay, bye.